Welcome to the Earn More, Stress Less podcast with me, Caro Sison. This podcast is for self-employed business owners just like you, who really want to grow their business and become successful and profitable, but without all the stress and hassle. I want to share my 30 years of business experience to show you how simple it can be to earn more money and how you can get organized without needing a business degree or any other qualifications. I'll be talking about the easy steps that you can put in place right now to start earning more money today and to help you get the business that you deserve and dream of. Without further ado, let's get started. This week's podcast is sponsored by Pocket PA, helping self-employed business owners to get organized, understand their finances and do their accounts all in one place using a powerful online tool. If you're serious about making a profit and having a successful business, then using a simple digital web app like Pocket PA is the best way to grow and scale your business. Visit pocketpa.com for more details and start managing your money like a pro today. Hello and welcome to the Earn More Stress Less podcast with me, Carrie Sison. Thanks for joining me. This week, I've got a great guest here with me. I've got Carol Devenny, who's an expert in helping small business owners to get contracts working with corporate businesses. So as a B2B strategist, that's business to business, she can help you as a small business owner to learn how to navigate the scary world of corporates, get in front of these big, large organizations, win contracts, and build long-term repeat income on your terms. Carol's got over 20 years of experience in the corporate world and a huge network to help you. And I'm really excited because I can see how working with corporates can massively help help you build financial security, a better lifestyle and freedom, which I expect were all the reasons why you started your business in the first place. So let's have a look at how working with corporates could break that cycle of feast and famine with Carol today. Carol, hello. Welcome. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hi, Carol. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure. So small business owners versus large companies, they seem the polar opposite. They don't seem to have a lot in common. So how can they work together in harmony so that one can service the other and both sides then are match a match made in heaven? How does that work, Carol? Um, so it actually works much better and much easier than people think. Um, people have this con- concept sometimes that if you want to work with corporates, you have to be a huge business. Now, the reality is that most corporates actually want to work with small businesses, and there are some good reasons for that. So if they are um, a large corporate, especially if they're also a government organisation, they will generally have policies that say they want to spend a lot of their money with small businesses. And that's because we know that that makes economic sense. Like small businesses tend to pay their taxes. I don't know about any of your listeners, but I don't have an offshore account for my money. Um, you know, Me neither. Yes. I think so. And so most small businesses don't. They, they, they put their money in the bank account. They pay their taxes. Maybe they pay them a little bit late occasionally, but they tend to pay their taxes. They tend to invest in themselves and their businesses and their employees. Small business people are, are really like the lifeblood of, of the UK economy, and that's really well recognised. So that's why big corporates and governments do actually want to spend with them. It's all about them not only doing the right thing, but being seen to do the right thing. So for them, they want to promote the fact that they work with local businesses and small businesses. So if you've got large corporates with a headquarters near you or a branch, or they're doing any activity like in your geographic area, that is a great way to engage with them um, because they they quite often really want to do that. So that, that harmony piece is definitely there. And you don't have to become bigger in order to work with them. They know that when they seek you out, you're going to be a small company. Perfect. And does that work for whether you're an online business or a bricks and mortar and offline business? Because I was trying to work this out um, before we started talking. And I was thinking, for example, people that deliver services day to day, face to face, either in the health or the beauty sector or more practical things where they exchange their time for money. They might not automatically think that they have a product or a service that could go into a corporate or offer it some, something like that. So what sort of things could people be offering to the corporates that might be attractive to them? Yeah, so there's there's lots of things and that's definitely sometimes a bit of a myth that, you know, some of the bricks and mortar businesses or service businesses don't have something they can sell to corporates. It's very, very rare I ever meet any small business owner who doesn't have something. So he, here's an example of one I would come up with. If you say perhaps you're in the beauty business and you provide beauty services, You might be somewhere where the local authority who've got like a role in encouraging employment um, or maybe a voluntary 
like a, a large charitable organisation, they might be doing some work to help people get back into the workplace. It's something they might be doing are sort of mini makeovers to boost people's self-confidence. They don't necessarily want to go to, I'm trying to not say the, the, the brand names of big, big um, cosmetic companies, but, but people will know what ones I mean, the ones in the glossy magazines. Yes, the ones that everyone knows because they're another big corporate. Yes, uh -huh. so they don't necessarily want to go to those companies because some of those people far removed from the jobs market will just feel incredibly intimidated perhaps in that environment. And also these places are premium priced because they've got big overheads, you know, they're in department stores, they're on high streets. Actually going to a more, a more local business is good for them because it's going to have that more personal feel. And also smaller businesses have lower overheads. So corporates can get quite a good deal on the package, but small business owners are actually still charging more than they would to consumers. So it's a very virtuous circle in, in that term. Sorry, so small business owners don't have to compromise and reduce their prices because the corporates already have a larger budget to be able to pay for these services. So it's not that the small business owner is being chipped away on their price. They're able to actually charge premium prices still and be well paid for their services and still get a good match. Is that right? Absolutely. They will charge corporates more than they'll charge consumers. So there'll usually be a significant difference in how much they can charge. And where would these small business owners go? Where would they start? I know that that's something that you do a whole load of specialism and you do courses and things like that on it. And I know you've had a book out recently, which I've, I've got here sitting on my desk, which is one of the reasons that I definitely wanted you on to talk about this today. But where do people start? What's the, what's the beginning place? Place that people go if they think, gosh, I'd like to work with some corporates, where do I start? So I've, I've got a really simple tip. I mean, there's loads of different methodologies. The one I like to do is, is all about being intentional because I like to be the master of my own destiny. I want other people to feel like they're in charge of it. Um, and the corporate landscape is huge. So the thing I suggest is, who do you want to work with? Like, look around at which corporates maybe are near you or you're interested in or you're in some way drawn to it because that's quite often either you really like their product or their service, or you're drawn to their values. Like people tend to be drawn to similar values. Once you, you know, write down a big list of those, then just start looking on their websites at how you can work with them. You'll find that like a lot of really large corporates, if you look on their website about how you can work with them, some of them actually run free courses for small businesses. Like we match clients up with us all the time where they'll maybe say, oh, I'd love to work with this company, but I don't know how to get started. Quite often at that point, I'm like, well, you don't need to come and work with me yet because they run a free course that will show you and teach you how to work with them because that's how committed they are to working with small businesses that they actually come out and teach you how to engage with them and how the contracts work and how the money flows in and out. So that, that's what I would suggest. Figure out first, who do you want to work with? So where would you go on their website to look? What tab would that be under? Which area would it be? Is there a specific tab that says, hey, if you're a small business owner and you want to work with us, <laughs> click on this? Because in my experience, it's never that simple, but I wish they would put that in there. Yeah, and it never is. And actually, we, we, we do employ a researcher who does some of that work. Um, but I would say it's the bit you're probably not looking at. So it's about us. It's work with us. It's... Um, sometimes it's buried deep in the website and it'll be on like the, um, I'm trying to think what it's called, like the corporate social responsibility policy. Sometimes it's in the sustainability policy. Um, we've actually got a you see, as a small business owner, you no. wouldn't know that. You wouldn't know about these these avenues because you don't call any of those things. You, you're not familiar with that word, those jargon things and those terminology. That's a corporate thing. So as a small business owner, you already feel a little bit disadvantaged and that you're on the outside looking in and thinking, well, I'd love to work with you at Vodafone or wherever it is at BT Openreach or whatever. And I offer X, Y, Z, but I, I don't even know how to knock on your door. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to contact. So that that often, I think corporates need to have that mindset where they are making themselves more approachable if that's really what they want to do to work with us small business owners. Um, that would be my top tip if they were asking for advice, <laughs> which they haven't come to me for yet. Maybe they should, because what corporates will say, and you, you know, my, my part of my business is working with corporate clients and corporates, will, when I tell them about the work we do with small businesses, they say, oh, but we really want to work with small businesses. We put it in our corporate social responsibility policy and the link is there in the website. I'm like, how, how often do you think small businesses are trawling the websites, looking for these things and reading them? And they're like, oh, 
Oh yeah, I guess they're busy because their perception is actually that small business owners have all this time and freedom. But even the term corporate social responsibility, that does not shout to me, I'm looking to work with a small business owner. Is that you? Corporate social responsibility. That's a mouthful on its own. And that's what makes me giggle because they seem so far removed. And yet they do have these budgets and they do want to put money with small businesses, particularly local business owners, single solo business owners. Um, So, Carol, I'm sorry, we skipped over right from the start because I wanted to jump in. I was so excited. But tell us a little bit about your background and how you've reached this point, because I know you've got so much experience from working on both sides. So do tell us about that, please. Um, I'll give you the kind of potty history. I mean, I, I left school. I was supposed to go to university and study law, but I decided instead that I would go and work in a news agents because you could make, you know, £60 a week and that seemed like a, a fortune. And I won't say what year it was. That'll give too much away. Back in um, the day. Back in the day, yeah. Back in the day, that seemed like an enormous amount of money. And going to university just seemed a lot of hard work. So I, I didn't bother. I do not recommend this as a course of action. Listen to your parents. Um, fast forward in a couple of years, I was working for um, a large corporate organisation then. I, they actually ran pubs and bingo halls and things. And around the time I was about 19, I found that I was pregnant. So my life was going in quite a different direction from what I thought it had going to be. You know, I was going to go to um, a premier university, study law. I was going to be like Ali McBeal or something. You know, that, that was kind of the trajectory. But instead you went to a news agent, to a company and then to a maternity wing. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. It was Lovely. Quite, quite a different map. Um, definitely not one I'd mapped out for myself. Um, where you begin is never where you end up. Exactly. Fine. And I say that to young people all the time. Like, you, you never... Because I, I now realise I'm, oh, I'm not a young person now. <laughs> but And I actually have some advice, not preaching, but some advice that don't matter where you are, you can still end up wherever you want to be. Um, but I essentially ended up going, giving up my, my career in, in that sort of corporate to basically go and train to be a nursery nurse to spend time with my son because I was, I was just not able to work and have him um, be, be sort of looked after all the time. So being on my own with him eventually, that, that was kind of my business. I managed to work three jobs, bought a very small nursery, took him to work with me for a few years and thought, once he went to school, this is never really what the dream was. Managed other people's nurseries for a while and then ended up in this job as a, a project manager where I was essentially working on urban regeneration pro- programs so people would recognize that as being like um working in impoverished areas where you redo the house and you know build much much better house and, and then lots of integration programs so helping people get back to work my route and had been through childcare is a huge barrier for people trying to escape poverty so my role had originally been helping people match up with childcare and get into work um, and that sort of evolved to running um, immigration integration programmes, refugee settlement programmes and the construction portfolio in that company. And from there, I pretty much went into building railways, which is what has brought me <laughs> to where I am now. So yeah, I've, I've taken some different courses. How did you go from immigration resettlement to building railways? Because I moved from one form of project management to another. So we were working in local redevelopment that included you know, the human aspect of it and the infrastructure aspect of it, because you have to do both together for it, for it to work well, um, regenerating lots of parts of Glasgow. And I actually got a phone call from my dad, believe it or not, saying, you know the kind of thing you're doing over in that part of Glasgow? Well, they're going to do that with a railway. And I think the work that they are doing is what you, you do. I thought, well, a lot of what I did was basically collect like write lots and lots of business cases for people to give us like what we call a cocktail of funding. So we would get lots of little amounts of money, add it all up together and then run these bigger programmes. So I I sort of managed about a million pounds then, which seemed like a phenomenal sum. And and this big project to do this railway was 297 million, I remember it being. It was, I mean, that that was a big jump. (laughs) I couldn't get my head around the numbers for a while. That's crazy. But I think that that's a huge example of how transferable your skill sets are because when you're self-employed, whatever it is you're doing, and in, in most jobs, you are able to, if you're a bit innovative, to realise that so many things that you're learning, I say as a parent, you when you're when you're a stay-at-home mum or whatever, you're learning time management skills like never before. Suddenly you're able to prioritise and work things out and juggle things in a way that you were never able to do perhaps in your previous work. And suddenly you ne- learn these new skill sets, which actually will stand you in good stead for a new role or are incredibly transferable. So you moved from managing 
nurseries and those sorts of things into railways and not even just 10 xing the budget that you had that was that was a gazillion times more wasn't it <laughs> that's crazy yeah. Yeah, and and it, and it felt like a huge jump. I remember the salary jump at the time was an increase of about five thousand pounds a year. And my husband and I were talking about it, you know, like like life changing money because it was life changing money. It genuinely was. Um, I didn't know that within the space of, I guess, thirteen years, I would. So I went, I joined that company to be a sponsor and sponsor one project. Within sort of thirteen years, um, I, I was actually the head of sponsorship for the whole company. And I was overseeing a portfolio of thirty-four billion pounds. Wow! And, and Another wow! I, give, <laughs> I know. And, and the reason I give that example is when I went for that the interview for that, which was a senior job. It was I had taken a couple of big leaps, and I got some feedback from the guy who recruited me because I sort of jumped two two leaps to get to get that final job. And when I went for my feedback, and I said. I'm really excited, you know, thanks thanks for this opportunity. I recognise you're taking a bit of a chance on me. And he said, well, and one of the things he said is, well, one of the reasons that I recruited you is because you've got this entrepreneurial spirit. Now, I had been like 13 years in corporate by then, or no, probably 15 years in corporate, and I thought, it's a strange thing to say. And I said, what made you describe me as entrepreneurial? And he said, i seen on your CV you used to have your own business. So he was looking back to a time when I had been like 23, had had a really small own business. I can't say that we made huge amounts of money. It's a very, very difficult environment to make money in. You've got huge overheads and a lot of volatility and people don't always want to pay you. And you're the last to get paid, you know, in a small business. I'm sure all all the people listening um, will recognise that being the last to be paid thing a lot of the time. Um, But he was looking at that as something all those years later he totally valued so you just never know like where in the journey people see that that value in it yeah that's so interesting and did he mention that you'd started at the news agents at 19 and that uh you hadn't gone to university that didn't matter to him at all I'm sure <laughs> no no he, he did not care less and, and actually I mean I, I didn't actually have a degree when I went to work for that company building 300 and, uh, 297 million pound railways uh, I actually hadn't got my degree by then I didn't get my degree until I was in my 30s that's crazy so so just to recap so you've obviously moved hugely up a corporate career ladder which a lot of us who are self-employed and have always been self-employed having well I've worked in the NHS for two years that was my only employed role a long time ago but I've always worked for myself these sorts of numbers are just like Mickey Mouse they're like lottery numbers so it, it feels again that sort of reinforces that feeling that corporates are over here with these huge budgets and a lot of money and they do things so differently to that solo self-employed business owner like myself who just work on a very small scale and we're always keeping an eye on costs and overheads and money coming in and looking at the end of the month and that sort of thing. So I love the whole idea how you are connecting the two universes because that's exactly what they are. (laughs) They seem to operate in parallel universes and I love this whole idea of bringing it together. So what brought you to this point to decide to match up and you know the book's called the gap in the middle and you know I we always say mind the gap for the tube in London and stuff and and all I'm doing is looking into seeing what a huge gap there is but how can you get rid of that gap in the middle Carol what's brought you to that point where you wanted to match up and actually let small business owners in on the secret of how they can get working with corporates yeah well when I was in corporate I left that big company and went over to work in Canada as you know a year into the job, I thought this isn't this the job changed and it wasn't the job I wanted to do anymore. So during that whole time, I had had targets to to work with small businesses because we always had government funding. So that means one pound in every three should be spent with small businesses. There were years that I would smash every single target and be, you know, like traditional high performer, overachiever, workaholic sort of mentality in corporate which I laugh because it's not that healthy but a dynamic, but it's, it's it's successful, so it feeds it and you keep doing it. Um, but I would smash my targets, but I would never, ever be able to get the target of working with small businesses. Like, we'd never get one pound in every three out to small businesses. And that bothered me because I had been a small business. I felt like this should happen. Um, I felt like we were doing everything we could. And when I decided to leave that company in Canada, it meant that I had to come home. Um, or I had to leave that country really because I couldn't really go and work for another employer just because of some contract conditions and visa conditions. So I started to think about setting up my own business. Within a few weeks of, of announcing I was leaving, people started to offer me um, consultancy work. And I knew, okay, this is the time to do this. I'm never going to do it if I don't do it now. 
And what small business owners forget is that people in corporate have this huge admiration for the risk appetite and the feeling, the fear and doing it anyway that small business owners had. And I was like, oh, I'm used to an HR team and an IT team and someone putting money in the bank every few weeks. Like, it doesn't matter if I work an hour or, a, you know, a hundred hours this week, I'm getting paid in four weeks. So people, like that fear was definitely there. But I went ahead and did it and it, and it went really well. Like my business took off phenomenally well. I'm very fortunate at being able to turn that um, that knowledge into a business. And what I found is that people started saying, how are you working with clients that size? Like people couldn't see how as, as a solo person, because I hadn't attached myself to other firms, how I was managing to work with some really big firms. And I was taking work from some really big firms that, you know, big companies were expected to win the work and suddenly I was winning the work. And I was sort of saying, well, these are the steps that I would just take. So I, I guess over the years I had sort of forgot that I had learned a lot about working in corporate and how to do it. And I could turn that into business. You had an inside track, so you were able to use that to your advantage. So when you became that solo business owner and you were self-employed, you were able to fast track yourself and beat those other corporates because you had all that inside knowledge. And is that what you've you've now sort of put into your book and your courses and things to be able to package up and help other people to be able to fast track that? Yeah, and because I just started doing it for people that would ask me and I would meet people because I I had to build a new community because I didn't have a community of other business owners to speak to about the stuff that, you know, drives us mad and, and the stuff you can celebrate. You can't phone up your clients and go, hey, guess what? I just won a big contract with someone else that, like, um, we don't care. So creating that community, I then started to meet people that I'd be like, oh, my goodness, I know a client who would buy from you. And I would start to put them in touch. And I started to realise that the way to do this on a a bigger scale is to, to make it into a course, to write the book, to, to be able to scale it up. Because I could only help a certain amount of people because I still run a, a big corporate um, business in my own consultancy. So that's why I started just sort of, my plan was get all the small business owners together, especially people who are underrepresented in boardrooms. Like I'm an underrepresented commodity in boardrooms. There are people who are in groups who are even more underrepresented. And I knew getting them into corporates will actually influence corporates in a really positive way because they take something in that corporates don't have and they can start to see things through other people's eyes as well. So kind of my plan was gather up all the small business owners, get them into corporates, and that's how we take over the world uh, from the inside out. One person at a time. I love that. Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. So why don't corporates, why why do you not need to be scared of corporates? Because I still am. I think the whole thing of corporates, boardrooms, all of those things, they do scare the pants off me. <laughs> and it does make <laughs> me feel a bit nervous thinking that I would I would like to do that because I think I can see the pros that there could be huge opportunity. I was so interested that you're saying that one pound in every three, so a third of their budget needs to be spent with small business owners. But you're saying that not enough small business owners are aware of the opportunity or they're not putting themselves forward or do you think corporates aren't doing enough to find them and seek them out I think it's a bit of both so that that's what the gap in the middle really was for me is that th these are two parties that want to work together but corporates aren't doing enough and and that's not necessarily a criticism because sometimes they don't know what the right thing is to do to engage with small businesses um, and small businesses for a number of reasons don't want to work with corp or they do want to work with corporates but they have these barriers. So sometimes there's the mindset one. And then sometimes there's just the practical reality of, I just don't know how to do this. Like the corporate environment is huge. There's a ton of work out there, but how do I start? So that's why I wanted to create like a nine step. Here are the methods. Like this is where to start. This is how to finish. Um, what You asked me another question there. Sorry, Carol, that I was going to answer. And I, I've lost my track. What was it? Sorry, I probably asked too many questions there about why they didn't need to be scary. Oh, why they didn't need to be scary. That's what it was. Because I, I say this all the time, like, it's just people inside corporates. It's just people. There are other people just trying to do a good job. You'll find that they've got a lot of admiration for you as a small business owner because they think oh, you're creative, you're adventurous, you're entrepreneurial. I think that's a really important thing to keep hold of, to, to remember that they've got an, an admiration for what we're doing as small business owners because we were really brave to take that step and rely on ourselves and back ourselves to be able to step into that space and rely on ourselves. So I think that's good. I think it's maybe the suit thing. Do you think it's because they wear ties and suits and they seem to, they seem to be really <laughs> sort of not a cut above or whatever but they just seem 
I, I suppose when you're, you're when you're self-employed, you don't have a uniform necessarily, and you're much more casual, and you don't have to be somewhere by nine o'clock, and you, you're allowed to leave before six thirty, and that sort of thing. So those rules and boundaries around the corporate thing, and having to wear that suit and take a briefcase and all that sort of stuff. I suppose for the average entrepreneur and self-employed business owner, that just seems a world apart. I suppose another thing, a gap in the middle. Yeah, I, th- I think it does sometimes seem intimidating. I mean, don't get me wrong, there are still some boardrooms that when I'm going into it, yeah, I'm going to have some adrenaline rushing into my stomach because I feel like this is important, this matters. Um, But people don't have to be put off by, you know, the the uniform. In fact, COVID has actually made the office style a lot more um, relaxed and that will continue, I think. But, you know, just remember they put those suits on the same as us, one one leg at a time into one trouser leg at a time. Um, And I think when I started working in corporate and I started at Fortunately, at actually quite a senior level, which I felt was quite senior. But as I progressed up to sort of executive level in the company, each time you move up a level in the beginning, you think, oh, when I get into that room, like, will I be able to hold my own? Will I know what they're talking about? Like, you kind of maybe think, and it's a little bit of that theme of not feeling enough, isn't it? And then you go into that room and it's just people talking about ideas and trying to do their best. And I suddenly I realised after a few promotions, they're all just people. I think with corporates as well, they often have um, their own sort of language and jargons and acronyms and shortcuts and things that they use. And whenever I hear people using jargon or terminology that I don't understand, it automatically makes me feel a lot smaller and a bit marginalized. And I think people in corporates don't often think of that. They're just so used to using those shortcuts and those little terms. And they seem sort of a world away from the way that perhaps small business owners speak because it's not their familiar day-to-day conversation. So I think corporates Corporates need to be mindful of the fact that just because we're not familiar with how they're speaking, it's not a foreign language, but it's not words that we commonly use. But it doesn't mean that we're any less or we're any less capable or or business minded. I think that um, that's another little gap in the middle, I suppose, that I've observed. Yeah, definitely. And, and there are two reasons people use jargon. One is it's just the language of that industry or business. But you do get some people who use jargon to be exclusive. So they use jargon to make it clear who's who's part of the conversation and who's not. And people do that even to others. I mean, those are the people that you do not want to waste a second thinking about because they're not our kind of people. We don't want to work with them. We're not interested in them. And their judgment doesn't, you know, affect us in any way. We have to just throw that out out with the garbage. Um, What you can do to get a little bit familiar, I would say if anyone's looking to work in a particularly technical field or an industry, and this, this is a tip I give it all the time, like if you really want to work in a particular sector, get a couple of industry magazines and just flick through them. Even if they're not that exciting, more of the language will go in than you realise. Don't try and like learn it all. Just flick through it from time to time. Sign up to a couple of newsletters and have them in a bit of your inbox that you can read when you're bored. I work in, in the rail sector, so I do need to know some of the terminology for the level we work at. And um, When I went to work in a media um, environment with a particular client, I thought, I don't really know their abbreviations or terminology. I just signed up to a few of their newsletters. I read some stuff just because I thought, well, I don't need, I don't know everything, but I've learned a couple of words here that I can feel a bit of comfort, but also never be afraid just to say, I'm sorry, because I'm not in, in, you know, your your environment. I don't know what that that three-letter acronym means or that word. Like I am I am the queen of just saying, I'm sorry, I don't know what that means. Can you tell me? Because I work internationally and things don't always mean the same in context either. So you just got to ask. Well, if you're the queen of it, I'm the princess because I'm always putting my hand up and I'm saying, excuse me, could you just say that a different way? Because I didn't quite understand what you meant. And people are usually really accommodating and it's just like, oh, yes, yeah, so sorry. And they realise that they are in a in another sort of parallel universe talking about stuff that they're familiar with. So would it be suitable for people if they're making things? So I know a lot of people are service based, but some people are product based. If they're actually making something, can those sorts of things also be sold into corporates? Yes, absolutely. Um, there are different things you can sell if you're if you're making things. It might be that you're selling a whole product that they're going to buy and then sell retail, but it might also be that you're going to buy something that they team up with something else or they add a component to it. So I think people traditionally think, oh, if I've got a product, I can only sell to retail. And sometimes the worry is, oh, they'll last for 100,000 of them and I only make, you know, 50 a week. A week. Um, so, but remember that it's not just retailers that buy products. If you think of an organisation like um, Network Rail, who I used to work with, they have, you know, 35,000 employees, another 150,000 in the supply chain. Say you made toasters, 
How many toasters do you think they go through? Tons. <laughs> JP Morgan employ 180,000 people internationally. If you were selling coffee cups, they buy a lot of coffee cups. And also their suppliers. That's another good place to look. Who supplies the big corporates? But there's also definitely a good um, a good thing to look at is if you've got one local to you and you sell products, that ha- have a look at whether they buy that product. And don't forget that corporates have consumers as clients as well. When, when I was a um, senior exec, because we had got government funding, I couldn't buy my team anything with the company's money, which is right because it was public money. But I would have a budget every year for what I was going to buy my staff. So I would be buying treats for them. So that, that's also an avenue that you might find that there are people inside corporate spending large amounts of money on buying products for their team, for their suppliers and things like that. So that could be craft products if you're um, an artisan or if you make jewellery or if you do something that you might sell on Etsy, that sort of thing. Those sorts of things could be bought in as treats for staff, which they have a budget for. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if there's like an element of, um, in fact, I was speaking to someone recently who has got an artisan business where she creates a product, but she also teaches people how to do it. And I was saying, well, that would be great to do that as a team building and if I was buying that, I would want people to like have their own experience doing it, make the thing, but I'd also want them to have a good proper thing at the end of it. I don't want to say what it is because she might launch her business and she's the only person in the UK I've heard of doing it. I don't want to give it away. So how exciting. Great, great, great yeah. avenue for people to go down. But yeah, and there's, you know, I would say at the moment, like social consciousness is, is quite high. So people are very interested in small makers, like who's making, you know, um, rather than buying from big conglomerates. So definitely a good avenue for products. And another way that they could work is also through speaking engagements. Is that right? So they're often looking for new people to share the message or to share their stories because they have to fill those sort of slots. Is that that right? Yeah, absolutely. Speaking engagements are great, especially if people have got... And when I say an interesting story, people say no one goes... No one but a a megalomaniac goes, well, I have a fascinating story. (laughs) You know, we all think our story is just mundane, but actually everyone's got an individual story and people are super curious about other people. If you think, oh, I don't know what corporates are like and who these people are like, they're same as the true and reverse of them looking out and going, I don't know what these entrepreneurs are like that take an idea and then turn it into a whole business. So people are fascinated by that because it's creative, it's interesting. So, yeah, the speaking circuit is absolutely huge. And th- and that's a nice way to get in. You know, some people are actually make quite a substantial amount of money going around speaking to corporates. That's really interesting. So apart from just looking on the website, would you, would you suggest approaching some corporates um, directly just to do you go into the HR department or where do you, you normally when you go onto a website, you just see the contact us page? Where would you be directing your inquiry to? Um, so that that's a bit hard to give a generic answer because it depends what people are selling. I would always say try and create a relationship or find a contact with a person who will who will buy in what what you would be offering. Um, but lots of people will have people on your network that they can speak to about. You know, lots of us know people who've got jobs. They will probably know who the person who buys for your company is. Um, a great thing to do is go to events and expositions where you might find corporates there and speak to them about it. So it, it really depends on, on what you're trying to do. But being able to make a personal contact is great. If they have any of the links on their website where you can register as a small supplier, absolutely fill those out, get that over to them. If you've got a product, get an example of it in people's hands. Like people love a, a product getting sent to them. The, the thing I quite often do for my, to my clients or people that I want as new clients is I'll send them something handwritten through the mail because in corporate, you don't really get much mail, so it creates an instant impression. Like I used to get 300 emails a day, but I very rarely got a letter delivered, so guess what gets attention? Good idea, yeah. And Carol, I know you do a course and other things around this to help people if they want to have a hand. Can you just explain a little bit how that works? Because I think it's something that I would probably want to be handheld in. So what, what sort of services do you offer to be able to help people get into corporates? Yeah, so, so we do a lot of things that are free because I recognise that for some people, it might feel like a bit of a scary step. So we, we have got a free Facebook group And I'm also running a free six-week course at the moment, which is just helping people kind of get themselves and and their business ready for even thinking about working with corporates. Um, And that's all on our Facebook group. Then we run a nine-week course called The Corporate Method, which is essentially step-by-step 
you know, where, where do you go from starting with an idea right through to, OK, I'm now winning corporate work. Um, and, and that's a supported course. The way we run that next year will be a little bit different because I love to do in-person stuff. And our last round of the course, we did uh, two, one in-person day a few weeks ago and the other one's this week on Thursday. So I've now decided every time we run the course, we'll run four in-person events because that gives people the chance to sort of, because you were asking you know, about that personal, who should they contact in person, that little bit of personalised input can sometimes be the thing that unlocks it for small businesses. And I, I have a bit of a superpower in someone telling me their business and me being able to say, here are three things you could sell to corporate and here are 10 corporates you could work with. And I like to do that in person. So that, that's what the course looks like. And I, I work with people one-to-one -one as well. I generally say working with me one-to-one, -one, it's worth being in the free group for a while first and figuring out, like, is this something you want to do? Um, probably for my one-to-one -one calls, half the people I say spend more time just figuring this out before we actually move into doing it because that's when we're really ready to go full at it. Perfect. And what about contracts and things? Do people have to have contracts in place with the corporates or what do you recommend for that side? So, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to completely contradict myself and say never ever work with a corporate without a contract in place, but I started working uh, on Thursday last week with one of my long-term corporate contracts uh, contacts with no contract in place. Um, which means I'm working at risk. So I'm doing work I might not get paid for. It's it's not going to happen. Like I, I work for them all the time. They're in an emergency. We'll sort it out. But yes, I would generally say you must have a contract in place. Most corporates will send you their contract. Um, for anything under about ten thousand pounds, you might want to have a, a little proposal ready, and they'll send you. They'll attach that to their former contract. But yeah, do not work with con corporates without a contract because sometimes you'll find people think they've agreed to work with a person and that person didn't actually have the authority to authorise the work. So yeah, you want you want a contract in place all the time. And is that one of the things that you cover in your course? You talk about that or is that in your book? Um, I don't think I talk in my book about contracts. That's terrible that I now can't remember what's in my own book. Um, I, I probably referred to it a little bit, but I won't have talked much about it. Um, I do cover on the course contracts, yeah. Okay, perfect. Carol, there's been so much here. And I think this will be a real interesting point for a lot of people. They didn't even have this on their radar about having an income stream from working with corporates. But as we said, right at the beginning, you know, they're wanting to spend their money with you. And it's just looking to find that good fit. And once you get that relationship being built, it could be a really good income stream for you, repeat income, getting you into other places. And you know, you could really take off if you get the if you get the right formula. So it's definitely worth some time looking looking into it and, and building those relationships. Um, thanks so much for sharing. If people would like to get in touch, Carol, how, how should they reach you? Um, so they'll find me on caroldevenny.com or they can come into my free Facebook group, which is Entrepreneurs Getting Into Corporate. And you'll find me on Instagram as well. And if they want to look at my corporate business for, you know, to see what we do, my business is actually called Sea Change International Consultant Limited. And, and on that, they'll see the kind of work that we do in the corporate environment as well. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you so much as well for listening to Carol and I today. It's been great to have you with us. I'm sure you've learned loads of new things. So do check out the show notes and have a wonderful day, whatever it is you are up to. And I'll catch up with you again soon. Thanks for listening to the Earn More Stress Less podcast with me, Caro Sison. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, then do hit subscribe so we can catch up again soon. And please kindly leave a review if you've got a moment and share with anyone else that you think this podcast could help on their self-employed journey. If you're ready to make bigger breakthroughs in your business life and want to get way more organized and understand your finances the really simple way, then start your very own 14-day free trial today using the super powerful software tool Pocket PA that I made for my own son and daughter. Go to pocketpa.com forward slash podcast and let's get you on the way to earning more money and stressing much less. Have a great week, whatever you're doing.